Welcome back everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Today we have a lecture series under the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Anu Punan. He is an Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Childhood Unit 1. Uh, sir's field of interest is in the fields of general pediatrics and specifically pediatric rheumatology. So we will be taking a lecture today in the on a topic approach to malnutrition, specifically uh, protein energy malnutrition. This is mainly meant at the level of PG level students. I mean, if anyone have any clarifications or doubts during the lecture, please feel free to ask sir or maybe put, up, put down the chat box. Our lecture will soon be uploaded on the Department of Medicine YouTube website. Now, thanks a lot, sir, for taking agreeing to take this lecture for us. And uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, friends. So, uh, okay, I am... Uh, today, I am... I'll be talking about uh, protein energy malnutrition. So anyway, I might be brushing out your knowledge in uh, protein energy malnutrition. I will be trying to give an overview or for uh, over uh, protein energy malnutrition. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the global prevalence, etiology or what are the spectrum, how to assess and the management and the prevention. And uh, yeah, what is the global strategy about it? So we can start with a quote uh, of uh, Hippocrates, even at that time, if we could give individual the right amount of nutrition and ex exercise, not too much, we would have found safety, weight, health, well said, and uh, even important at that point of time. Malnutrition in all, maybe it's uh, otherwise described, it's a triple burden usually described in all its forms as undernutrition, can be wasting, shunning, standing or underweight, it can be because of inadequate vitamin or mineral deficiencies, or it can be, so malnutrition doesn't mean it's only undernutrition, the other raising challenges, overweight and obesity. It can be with results in diet related non-communicable diseases too. So uh, WHO defined PEM as a range of pathology condition arising from coincidental lack in varying proportion of protein and calorie occurring most frequently in infants and young children commonly associated with infection. If you, there's a lot of forms of malnutrition. If you talk about standing, we talk about low height for age. Mostly it is a result of a chronic or a recurrent undernutrition. We talk about wasting, we are talking about low weight for height, indicating a recent acute uh, onset and a severe weight loss. We are talking about underweight. It can be standing, wasting or both. We are talking about low weight for it. Other challenges, which are as said, overweight, which refers to, to weight high for her, where too, too heavy for her weight or height, age or height. We can, we can also say that this all comes under macronutrition, macronutrients related deficiencies. We can have micronutrient related malnutrition. There can be combination of this all together. Wasting and standing, it's due to, might be a result of poor nutrition intake or multiple, can result in multiple uh, diseases too. So an emerging challenge, which what I said is childhood, overweight, and obesity. Severe malnutrition, they have propensity to get infections. They have more than nine times higher risk of morbidity and mortality. So there is, uh, the picture dictates that it's a less height where uh, for the age or the sex, you say it as stunting. You say its weight is normal, height is normal, but is wasted. Its weight is less. We have, you see obesity here. They are both standing and wasting together. You have overweight and it's also standard. Doppler preference, if I talk about, you have to, so this is a 2019 data of WHO, which to 31.3 percentage more than 145 million children under five globally is standard. Wasting contributes around 6.9 percentage, more than 47 million children is affected. Overweight, which is an emerging problem, 
it's around 5.6 percentage of underweight children under 5 children around 45 percentage of death among children under 5 age are linked to undernutrition undernutrition makes children in particular more vulnerable to disease and death we see if uh, the who data one of the you see south asian uh, region see it's, uh, it's a huge uh, wasting is around more than 15 percent is very high uh, relating to other in uh, east african or middle african uh, regions stunting if you think if you see it's again south of south asian east african middle african all regions they all are more than 30 percentage it's also very high over the friends it's a challenge emerging challenge might be uh, still the south asian it's uh, around 2.5 to less than 5 percentage but uh, might be the uh, south american western countries it is again more Okay, in Indian data, data so standing around 23.4 percentage, and around underweight is 19.7 percentage, overweight around 4 percentage in the new 2019 to 20 in National Family Health Survey. So why 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 uh, we are talking about uh, this age group that's uh, uh, under five? The reason being the risk. of undernutrition occurs in the first 100 days usually it's a date of conception to child second birthday again it's uh, again the importance is the intervention there it it it's if you starts intervention it it has long term benefits women infants children and adults in particular risk of malnutrition severe acute malnutrition is the most severe and life threatening form of malnutrition again this is one of the um, uh, data uh, around malnutrition around 55 percentage of all the deaths occurring on, on under 5 population you have malnutrition they are have more propensity to have, have infection or more deaths are happening where or when the malnourished child is getting infection if you see the during first six months around 20 to 30% in india if you are taking indian data even all are low birth weight or it's already malnourished by that time after four to six months of age unhygienic food late introduction of complementary feeding inadequate food intake or recurrent infection predisposes to undernutrition malnutrition children typically develops during the period of 6 to 18 months of age this is a time when there is the growth velocity and the brain development is essentially high and the any uh, malnutrition at the point or the stress at the point affects growth in all domains nutritional status of children can also be affected by chronic infection so this is one of the unicef conceptual framework for undernutrition see the social uh, risk factors like maternal education age family overcrowding occupation which usually affects food security which in turn lead if lead to uh, might be uh, with breastfeeding practices multiple infections in the uh, age group under 5 lead to child undernutrition so uh, i talked about some of the etiologies mostly it is said as it's a man made disease we can there are now no, term some time theories but uh, name theories which are related to malnutrition so these are all the older hypothesis which initially which was initially if, uh, it was said as protein deficiency which was the results of uh, protein calorie malnutrition which was termed uh, which was the first term for it so uh, later other theories like toxic theory niacin theory except came out the uh, recent uh, or uh, uh, well uh, uh, explained theories or the uh, hypothesis on pm is one is 
Gopalan's adaptation and disadaptation theory, which literally mean the, the child who adapt to the stress might be hunger, or, uh, to the stress will lead to marasmus and uh, the child which don't adapt to the stress will go into Kershiyoka. That is one of the famous theory, Gopalan's theory. And later, free radical theory, golden theory also, which says about uh, the inadequate, so imbalance between the toxic free radicals and the disposal in the uh, body, which lead to uh, these uh, syndromes. So, uh, if I talk about spectrum of protein energy malnutrition, initially the uh, the syndromes which were explaining the like Kashiwaka, marasmus, edematous malnutrition, this all says about it's only a tip of the iceberg. So, malnutrition was widely affecting uh, children under five or more than the age group uh, in all the domains. So, yeah, I will. Uh, Initially, uh, Jellif, who co coined the protein calorie malnutrition, later it was renamed as protein energy malnutrition. The most common age, as I said, it's around six to two years of age, and 50 to 60 percent of children had clinical manifestation before two years of age. Usually, marasmus and Kashioka, it's just a representative of iceberg. 60 to 70 percent of children with malnutrition has mild to moderate malnutrition and remained uh, remaining as severe malnutrition. Even there is a term like subclinical malnutrition too, which but uh, where, where is the importance? Early detection of this and the intervention has a key role. As I said, uh, it's severe malnutrition is just a end of a tip berg, means iceberg, tip of iceberg. So, Kashioka, which was also called as edematous malnutrition, marasmus is also called as non edematous malnutrition. You have, can have overlap, which is called as marasmic Kashioka too. Despite the causes, it's important to assess the severity of malnutrition based off anthropometric criteria. So, I will explain uh, in detail about Kashioka and marasmus, then uh, go into the management assessment. Kashioka, which it was first explained by Professor Cicely Williams. She was a Jamaican physician who was posted in uh, uh, old Gold Coast. It's uh, old Ghana now, just in Ghana. So she was under uh, colonial medical service. She was a woman medical officer there. Where she noticed children coming with uh, uh, malnutrition and uh, yeah, edematous, like uh, pedal edema, uh, limb edema uh, with this type of typical uh, peculiar type of skin lesions. So uh, initially even uh, most of the um, uh, papers coming out was uh, like is it scurvy like presentation. So she she thought it's something different. So she, she, paper, she published papers on uh, Kashuoka. She called it as sickness disease of a disposed child. This mostly uh, she noticed when um, the when the infant is weaned out of breast milk when the mother is again pregnant. That uh, that was the term. This was a, uh, the, she termed it as disease of disposed child. It's a sickness of weaning. It's also called as sugar baby, and uh, yeah, usually commonly develops around one to three years of age. When he is nutritionally deficient, again breast milk also is disposed of breast milk to weaned off breast milk to. Classical case of Kashioka, it will be apathic, standard or malnourished child with edema, starting mostly in the leg, might have hepatomegaly, anemia with skin and hair changes, can be associated with vitamin deficiencies. They have a peculiar type of tremor, which was termed as Kashi shake. So classical, this is in the pictorial reference presentation. You are seeing sparse uh, hair, puffy uh, face with the apathy and uh, wasting. Might be they can have hepatomegaly. They can have this peculiar type of uh, characteristic skin lesions. Might leading to ulcers too. 
Skin changes are collectively called as nutritional dermatosis. The named skin lesion dermatosis are flaky pain dermatosis and crazy pigment dermatosis. They can have deep pressures, dry and scaly skin, mostly mosaic pattern. They can have ulcerations, gangrenous dermatitis. Skin lesion are pathogen monic of Kashoka, but absence doesn't exclude it. The classical triad we explains growth retardation, edema, and mental change. Classical hair change described as thin, scanty, lusterless, spurseless, typical flax sign. It might be it's a pigmentation and deep pigmentation, which you see in the their hairs, which is due to the period of nutritional deprivation and might be lusterless colors. Phase, usually uh, it is uh, moon phase and cheek appears full. Grades, according to severity, there is grading and uh, the lesser, so usually the period, only pedal enema is greater as grade one and when severity increases, it has, you have ascites, generalized edema, it is greater as grade four. So here you see the typical flaky pain dermatosis. And here you see the crazy payment dermatosis. If you talk about uh, marasmus, yeah, so non edematous malnutrition, usually uh, it characterizes by complete loss of subcutaneous fat. Child will be well alert than in a Kashiwaka child where the child is, will be apathic. It might be in the later part, can be uh, irritable and apathic. Might be when the infection sets in. He has a good appetite. Because of this loss of subcutaneous fat, it might be they might have an old man appearance. Skin might be loose and wrinkled. It's also called as baggy pain appearance. It is also graded. You have uh, um, loose, uh, loose skin folds in the axilla and growing. And later, with severe wasting, you have buckle part of fats, if mostly wasted uh, at the end of, uh, if it is very severe. If you think, I mean, if I tell about the difference between Kashok and Marasmus in the table, like the age group, Marasmus usually the infant is affected, mostly little older children, Kashok, uh, seen in uh, older children, Kashok, and might be, it's usually precipitated with an infection, might be like, TB might be measles, like some acute infection which uh, bring out the disease. Edematous is usually Kashoka, usually marasmus don't have edema. Severe wasting will be there or severe malnutrition growth failure will be there, but because of edema it will be mass in Kashoka. You have severe mental change in Kashoka like irritable, apathic, Mental change I means usually marasmic children are uh, uh, very alert and uh, might be they have a good appetite. Where Kashoka children they don't they have very poor appetite. Hair changes are more hair and skin changes are more common in Kashoka than in marasmus. You can have biochemical changes in um, uh, both marasmus and Kashoka. Mostly hepatomegaly is seen in fatty liver is seen in cashew which is absent in marasmus. It's in a... So I, I talked about cashew and marasmus. Uh, I'm going to, uh, it's a, it's a, this is a um, uh, cornerstone in, in uh, malnutrition. Where assessment starts with anthropometric assessment. Multiple variables are there. You can have biochemical assessment, clinical assessment, dietary. You can have epidemiological tool, ecological assessment. This is, if you integrate, uh, so these are all newer, newer scales which coming into place for scoring systems, which, which try to uh, diagnose malnutrition early. Should be community, so community participation and uh, mostly the key role is by the health worker or dasha worker who who should pick up the malnutrition uh, early, might be with, during home visits or routine visits of these children to the uh, clinics. So these all anthropometric measurements are the gold standard for uh, assessing malnutrition. So 
Anthometry is a simple valuable tool and golden standard for evaluating nutritional status. It was, we have the age dependent measurements and age independent measurements. Like weight for age, height for age, head swans, all age dependent measurements. So initially we have classifications, which have uh, on, depending on the severity, how to choose which is normal and which is abnormal. We have a GOMA scale, IAP classifications, which uh, classify on the basis of weight for age. And do you grade under grade one to grade four, it's increasing in its increasing severity. You have Javelin classification also, which is based on weight for age. So there been one of the other named classification is welcome trust classification, which uh, divided uh, malnutrition into Kashoka, underweight, marasmic Kashoka, and marasmus. Especially when you have a uh, weight for age, uh, is, which is between 60 to 80 percentage of the reference, and you have edema, you call it as Kashoka. If it is weight for age is less than 60 percentage, and without edema, you call it as marasmus. If it is weight for ages less than 60 and you have edema, it is called as marasmic gas shock. So uh, for, you have McLaren's and Waterloo classification, which which based on height for age. This also we have, uh, according to the severity, we have, uh, they are classified standing. So uh, newer and newer classification, what was the back? The, uh, so, uh, what was the um, uh, benefit of a newer classification or what was the uh, <clears throat> pitfall in the previous classification was the reference standard, which was taken as uh, some Boston or Harvard standard population, which all our uh, children between one to five years of age, but I mean, it might be from birth and five years of age, which are all might be fed uh, with formula feeds and uh, well thriving children. So, um, uh, newer classifications WHO has uh, put forward uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, reference standards, sample populations from uh, developed and de developing nations. And we have uh, our own uh, means, uh, uh, WHO growth charts, which is based on these. Uh, Multi uh, different uh, sample populations, which is appropriate for our population, like in India. So, uh, the, most of the classification, the, this all uh, most important, the importance of this classification or how to uh, uh, detect this malnutrition early. So, they have uh, came up with the WHO ESET scores charts where you plot the weight or height, weight for age, you have charts for weight for age, weight for height height for age, all the charts where you will know that the child is it uh, below, um, which stands below, is it normal or is below uh, minus two to minus three standard deviation or it's below minus three standard deviation, It's which says it's a very severe malnutrition. So even uh, they put forward uh, one of the things, uh, uh, three criteria, uh, they uh, include a same edema, weight for height and height for age to classify malnutrition into moderate and severe malnutrition. So with edema, with a, it's a score less than three standard deviation in for weight for height and height for age on the basis of WHO growth charts, it's a score charts we can uh, diagnose severe malnutrition. The severe malnutrition, the spectrum involved even Kashioka, marasmus, marasmic Kashioka. So these all are the WHO research code charts. This is weight for age for boys and girls. We have different charts according to, or if so this is from birth to two year, you, the, we have WHO charts from birth to two year and two to five years. So I talked about age dependent measurements. Uh, if I talking about age independent measurements, one of uh, uh, the thing I should talk about is the midterm circumference. It's, it's really a, 
um, important indicator of acute malnutrition. And it's very, very easy. We have color code uh, uh, tapes, might be called as Shakir tapes, color code tapes for um, measuring the madam circumference. So uh, usually uh, the age group um, between six months or one year to five years, it's usually the midterm circumference is a constant. So anything below 12.5 percentage. So anything more than 13.5 uh, is centimeter. 13.5 centimeters is considered normal. Anything below 12.5. So around 12.5 to 13.5 is borderline and less than 12.5 centimeter is uh, considered as undernutrition. So uh, like Asha worker, uh, they can just color code it. When it's uh, uh, below 12.5, the color code will be red. And whenever it comes in that uh, uh, color, they will uh, refer the child to the uh, health center, which, which can be evaluated or intervention or can be started at the point of time. Other age-independent uh, indices, named indices are Kanavati, McLaren, which you take mid and supplements and head supplements, the ratio. You have Rao, Rao and Singh uh, index, Dugdale index, Jellyfish ratio. These are some of the name index. They, they, they all are age independent indices. They, they also try to classify malnutrition. So, clinical features I have already told uh, about cash worker where more uh, skin changes are very pronounced. One of the other things that they can be associated with uh, vitamin deficiencies. We can have vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, D deficiencies associated with these malnutritions. These all are the clinical features on examination which can be picked up. Severe hair change, skin change, muscle wasting, edema, can have anemia, which can be picked up on examination. So I talked about the integrated scale. It's called as ABC Q E E F Q malnutrition assessment scale. They usually integrated anthropometry, biochemical lab parameters, clinical features, dietary evaluation, ecology and epidemiology data, functional assessment, and quality of life. These all are scoring systems, uh, which which uh, again uh, uh, try to find. Uh, Put together and uh, um, to classify malnutrition and early detect malnutrition. Under National IAP Action Plan 2015. So uh, with the term is said about severe acute malnutrition, severe nutrition and severe uh, WHO term uh, uh, put forth severe acute malnutrition and they have put criteria. Uh, uh, for severe acute malnutrition. So if it is six months to among six months to five years, weight for height less than three standard deviation or an upper um, circumference less than 11.5 centimeter or a bilateral pitting edema, any of one of these signs, any of the features you can uh, consider classify it as severe acute malnutrition. In less than six months, mostly weight for her length less than three standard deviation or a visible edema, you can um, classify it as severe acute malnutrition. So uh, the WHO has put forward integrated uh, management protocols for managing children with malnutrition. So mild to moderate malnutrition, mostly it's managed at home. Its mainstay of treatment is dietary management and community-based management. Children with severe proteinuria malnutrition with complications must be hospitalized and it's facility-based management. Usually these both two levels of treatment is based on presence or absence of appetite test or uh, is there any complications or not. So if it uh, put in a nutshell, uh, initially the screening will be done by the health worker in the household or in the uh, community health center. Children uh, who has malnutrition or moderate or severe without complication, usually they are managed at home. 
might be with severe malnutrition, might be they will come to outpatient care. Usually we have nutritional rehabilitation centers for it. With severe acute malnutrition, with complications, mostly they are managed as inpatient. I talked about appetite test. It's nothing but child which who have which, who who uh, was classified under severe malnutrition as given something known as a ready to use therapeutic food, uh, appropriate for her age, the amount, and try in a uh, environment. It's uh, it's a calm environment on the lap of the mother. Are uh, given uh, amount little amount of uh, RUTF to eat. If child uh, eats so the required amount eagerly, then he passes the test. And if it refuses, uh, with even persistent encouragement, he fails it. So uh, uh, appetite test, if he fails in for appetite test, mostly with severe malnutrition, he needs intern uh, facility uh, uh, so admission in the hospital and treatment. Uh, if it is called as uncomplicated, if it's more than six months of age, the child is six months of age and he's alert, he has a good appetite, clinical assessment is to be well, and he is living in a conductive home environment. Criteria for admissions, <laughs> any child less than six months with malnutrition, mostly he needs uh, 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 hospital-based care. More than six months with complication, usually institution care is mandatory. Mostly um, uh, children's less than six months, having danger signs like edema, persistent vomiting, is apathic, very weak, or having infection, needs uh, facility-based management who has severe skin and eye involvement, who has severe anemia, and even if there is complications, he needs facility-based management. In a nutshell, if I talk about uh, management, uh, it's, uh, usually it is having three phases. One is acute phase, one to seven days, which uh, consists of uh, 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 treating the mostly the complications assessing the child and treating the complications and slowly we are starting uh, nutritional management you have uh, after uh, one to seven days if you manage the initial acute phase he will go into rehabilitation phase where nutrition physical emotional stimulus and uh, which has a key role to play in follow-up phase he needs uh, a regular follow-up and nutritional rehabilitation. So 10 steps of management of children with SAM. If it is in a nutshell, you have two phase, stabilization phase and rehabilitation. And there is a follow-up phase too. Initially, most of the complications like, like initially child, uh, you should uh, watch for or treat hypoglycemia, hypothermia, dehydration, and if there is any, any alkylate imbalance, this all should be uh, should be uh, cared for, uh, <clears throat> investigated for. You have to treat infections vigorously, even if it is moderate or uh, severe malnutrition. Correction of micronutrients deficiencies, mostly in the transition phase, usually iron, folic acid, vitamin A, has been uh, substituted. Feeds are being started very cautiously. Usually, we start with uh, uh, lower calorie, and uh, subsequently, when the appetite increases, it's gone to the higher calorie for the age, appropriate for the age. Then, definitely, he need some monitoring in during catch up growth and uh, yeah, uh, stimulation therapy and uh, yeah, uh, regular follow up. Prepare for follow up is needed. As are the uh, initial uh, WHO 10 steps of treatment. The Rasamal is uh, nothing but uh, the ORS for a malnourished child. Only difference with, from low osmolality ORS, they have uh, micronutrients like zinc, copper, and magnesium. 
Well, SML is not available in India. Uh, usually uses low similar ORS. Feeding, uh, we talked about uh, at the initial phase, usually you start with uh, F75 or F100. F75 usually, it is a formula of having a 75 kilocalorie per 100 ml of the uh, feeds. Very cautious to start with a lower calorie for the age, uh, for the uh, weight, and gra gradually it is graded up. Transitional phase, usually when the appetite improves, slowly we grade up the calorie. In later, when there is a good appetite and uh, the manage the medical complications are well managed, we go and so we start with ready to use therapeutic food. Ready to use therapeutic food is nothing but it's a kind of therapeutic food which is energy dense and at least 50% protein obtained from milk products. Given for children more than six months of age. So, when to discharge these children from the program? One of the uh, absence of bilateral edema for last 10 days, or if they gain 15% of weight from the weight on admission, or uh, and the medical complications are well managed and there is no other, no complications. But uh, children with less than six months need special care. In first ranks, less than six months, usually breastfeeding is provided, means given every three hours, it's mother is taught and um, encouraged to give uh, breastfeeding every three, uh, three hours, duration at least 20 minutes to ensure high meal. More often, the child asks for more at least eight times a day. WHO guidelines uh, in managing infants as outpatient or inpatient depends on the clinical course. When, see, when you say the spawn, this is responding to treatment, if there is a good weight gain, more than 10 grams per kg per day, if it is between 5 to 10 grams per kg per day, it's only moderate weight gain, you have to reevaluate. Uh, check for the intake and uh, search for infections like TB. Poor weight gain, it's a failure of the therapy. See, search for inadequate feeding. Is there any untreated infections? Is there any specific nutritional deficiencies? Evaluate for TB and HIV and other uh, issues. Failure to respond to treatment, if you say if primary failure, if failure to regain appetite by day four, failure to start losing edema by day four, presence of edema on day 10, Failure to gain at least five gram per kg per day by day 10. Secondary failure to respond. If failure to gain at least five gram per kg per day for three consecutive days during rehabilitation phase. Follow up plans. Most of our target will be uh, to recover 90% of weight for length on the height and uh, um, uh, absence of edema means disappearance of edema, treating the infection properly and the absence of infection, eating at least 120 to 130 calorie per kg per day, kilocalorie per kg per day, and receiving adequate micronutrients. Consistent weight monitoring is needed, and uh, the target should be at least more than five gram per kg per day for three consecutive days. We, uh, they are well encouraged and to complete immunization appropriate for the age. Caretakers are very well sensitized for home care before uh, discharging from the uh, uh, hospital or the nutrition rehabilitation center. If the nutrition status is corrected very rapidly in some children, they can manifest complication uh, one of it is pseudotumor cell where you have increased decrease pressures. 
You can have Goma syndrome, which usually is secondary to a production of trophic hormone, including estrogen by a recovering pituitary. You can have hepatosplenia megaliasitis, parotid swelling, gynecomastia. You can have uh, hand syndrome, which is predominantly seen as manifestation. You can have trauma, rigidity, or myoclonus, or cardiac failure too. So it's very cautious to start feeding in these children. You start with the lower calorie for the age and uh, slowly grading up. So uh, as in total, as a visual summary, so usually trained community workers are uh, well trained for early detection of this severe malnutrition. We have intercarrier management protocol, which involve community and facility-based care. So initial, as I said, initial screening criteria, weight for height using upper or upper, you know, <clears throat> upper arm circumference or visible edema. You can classify it under moderate uh, acute malnutrition or severe acute malnutrition. If uh, any of one is present, severe, so if you classify under severe acute malnutrition, is it be below six months of age or more than six months of age? Six to 59 months means five years of age. You check for the complications. If there is no complications, two things we do in these children. One, check for complications. Second, appetite test. If there is no complication, then he passes appetite test. So he goes into a home or a based care. If there is complication or if uh, he fails appetite test, he needs inpatient care. Or a moderate acute malnutrition, mostly they need hospital acquired, um, community uh, based care and home management with nutritional rehabilitation. These are some of the recent uh, studies uh, which uh, they um, uh, systematic reviews. They um, uh, seen the facility like uh, uh, efficacy of the WHO guidelines in facility based uh, uh, setup of uh, to reduce mortality in severely malnourished children in low and middle income countries. One of the recent uh, uh, data, it's in, from Kerala, they used indigenously prepared, ready to use therapeutic food, which were uh, used uh, instead of uh, WHO based RUTF. So each area they uh, has uh, indigenous uh, uh, RUTF, ready to use therapeutic food. When uh, in uh, uh, CMC we have, uh, something known as um, HCCA, high cereal calorie milk. Usually it gives um, uh, high calorie with protein, actually which is mostly started uh, in children's uh, with uh, undernutrition. So some of the key interventions to prevent malnutrition Critical window of opportunity is between this 100 day, 1000 days. Intervention one is establishing breastfeeding within half an hour after birth. Exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Proper complementary feeding, feeding the children during illness, proper hygiene, Immunization, to early, morning, early picking up malnutrition before they go into a complications or severe, severe malnutrition, taking care of adolescents and pregnant women. In a nutshell, timely initiation of breast milk early, exclusive breastfeeding for six months, Timely introduction of complementary feeding, age appropriate food for child between six months to two years, immunization and vitamin A supplementation with TVMA, monitoring growth and development and intervene early. Appropriate feeding of a child during and after illness, adequate nutrition and support to adolescent girl and pregnant and feeding mother. 
we have uh, nutritional programs in India, like midday mid meal program, national nutrition anemia prophylaxis program. You have uh, nutrition, national uh, rural health mission. Under uh, the rural health mission, they have been integrating this all various programs of early detection and intervention. So we're telling about global nutrition targets which is uh, for 2025, they are uh, target uh, achieving 40% reduction in number of standard children under five. I have various interventions for it. 30% reduction in low birth weight, that was one of the other target. Exclusive breastfeeding rates to at least 50%. Reducing and maintaining child wasting to less than 5%. These are one of uh, many of the uh, target, global targets nutritional targets. We have our sustainable development goal by 2030. We have multiple agendas, multiple programs for it. So the ultimate aim is for all children to be free of malnutrition in all its forms. Good nutrition allow children to survive, grow, develop, learn, play, participate, and contribute. Early detection of severe acute malnutrition with and without medical complication. Evidence-based integrated management involving continuum of care is the key to success and the minimize the burden of severe acute malnutrition in the community. In the life cycle approach, concentrating on female child and prospective mother seems more appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, sir, on that yeah, great talk on malnutrition, severe malnutrition, and protein and malnutrition. If there are any doubts or clarification, please type your questions in the chat box. So, uh, uh, one doubt regarding the management of severe acute malnutrition. If there is primary failure, uh, will that prolong the initiation phase as per WHO guidelines? And how do they manage? No, uh, see, uh, yeah, one of the failure, the effective uh, managing the complications is one of the things. Okay, so un see, when there is a primary failure, uh, one of the so. Uh, one of the key um, intervention which is done, which reevaluate or reassess the child, is it adequate that uh, nutrition what's adequately given? Is it uh, because of a persistent infection or is there any complication which is um, we, we we haven't noticed or untreated? Infections like TB, HIV, all the things which which will not be initially evaluated, but failure to this therapy might be we will go into the detail in detail for why there is failure that's the key what you have to find out why why why, why the child is not gaining weight instead of of instead of getting adequate nutrition nutrition supplements so if it is there it has to be treated my rightly pointed out is failure of the uh, complication management of the complication itself can lead to primary failure and in our setting how common is refeeding syndrome same, uh, yeah, that uh, I, I just uh, I didn't uh, okay. tell about most of the time. Now, our era, uh, the malnutrition, severe malnutrition, I, I think uh, it has been very, very less. Even uh, children with marasmus might be common, but cash yorker and all, it's very, 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 very less common. You are talking about the complications on treating them. Again, less, but uh, we're very cautious to feed these children. We have initially, like we have been seeing children with these refeeding syndromes, but it's very, very rare nowadays. But yes, this is one of the key for management. Nutritional rehabilitation is very cautious on initial feeding. Any more questions? Any more questions on the topic?
So you will be uh, okay. Anyone types, so you can send me the message also. No? Yeah, if there are any more questions, sir, will be available on email. We can provide that in our uh, website, and sir, this will be uploaded in our department okay. uh, YouTube channel in a week's time. And once again, sir, thank you for thank you. your valuable time and providing us updates on the topic. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you.